Hello everybody, this is Scott Stengel from Melco Applications team. Uh, today we're going to be sharing some information with you about uh, outlines. Uh, basically there's two types of outlines. There's walk stitch outline for smaller, thinner shapes and there's columns um, which are for thicker outlines around lettering, around logos, um, thick borders, stuff like that. So uh, I'm going to start talking about the walk stitch type. Some of this we've uh, mentioned, touched on before in other um, Facebook Live events, um, but uh, it's all interconnected and so it's always good information. All right, so uh, right here on my screen I have a uh, small text. I just digitized basically 0.35 inch uh, block letters, Melco. Um, and remember from the other ones, I usually use a vector line here, a couple of them, to show my compensations and height, because like we talked about before, everything is going to shrink on the sides and it's going to push up on the top and the bottom. So anything that is running uh, horizontally, stitching is going to push up, so that's why I've cut off these and I've cut them off at the bottom also. A little more compensation on the M because that really pushes hard. Same with W's and V's. So I cut that off just a touch shorter than uh, the L here. But notice that the rest of the, the letters go to full height because they're actually going to shrink because they are stitching up and down. Okay, so I've got my vector lines in there. Generally the first one goes to the top, then I will use the shift and the arrow keys to move uh, the height compensation down about four uh, four taps, which is four points for each. That's that's an average um, amount of uh, compensation for smaller uh, text. So Scott, when you say tap, um, uh, shift plus the arrow keys. So shift plus the arrow key equals a, a point at a time movement. It's one point. See one like that. Then I'm awesome. moving down. So then you get full control because if you drag it with the uh, mouse, it's very hard to control um, you know, to make it consistent. So I'll stretch those across. I also use them a lot of other ways if you have poor artwork and you need to make the columns a certain you know uniform width so your lettering looks decent. You can use uh, up and down uh, vertical um, vector lines in order to um, help uh, keep your digitizing consistent width. So if you don't have the vector lines because your software, your design shop level doesn't have that, you can easily, as Nate's talked about before, use a, um, a regular walk stitch. Just make sure you delete them before you sew it because <laughs> else it will sew. Okay, so we have our uh, text done. Now we're going to do some borders. So I will change to black. I will pick a walk stitch. Remember when it comes to properties, we want to shorten the stitch length for these um, walk stitch outlines. Like I would mentioned before, double walk stitch with 40 weight thread is usually what you want for finer detail or outlines around smaller text. One uh, run tends to be too weak. Um, a bean stitch tends to be too much, so uh, two works out just good, although as you'll see, you can't always make everything a perfect uh, two times around. Sometimes you have to go with a third. In um, this case, it's better, like you'll see on the E, when I start here, I'll go around once, go around twice, then I still need to get to the end if I'm going this direction to sew that. So this is going to have a third layer, but it's not a big issue because it's a small amount. So three is better than one, um, but you're shooting for two. All right, so uh, I will turn on my uh, tie-in and tie-off. You can see <clears throat> style one is what you want for small walk stitch outlines because it's in a straight line. If you have something that, uh, like a plus sign, like style five, it's going to sometimes show up as um, kind of a blob at the corner. Okay, so I'm gonna digitize this outline left to right just to kind of make it simple for you guys. So I'm gonna start here on the M in the lower corner. Now, <clears throat> I'm gonna start down here at the bottom. I'm not starting up here because if I do, the letter's gonna hang down below as I've showed you before. All right, so I'm going to start at the bottom corner, and basically all I'm going to do is hit the exact corners. Now I'm holding Alt so that I get exact um, straight lines, nothing drifts, 
and I'm coming back up to the top. I'm not going to digitize this whole word, but I'm going to show you kind of the basics of it. Come down to the bottom. Here I'm just holding Alt. I'll come down to the center section around here. Uh, that's too much. Okay, down here, and so that's one layer. Then I will go around again, and I'm going to hit the same exact points. I find that if the needle penetrations line up the second time around, it gives the cleanest look. Some people uh, stagger <clears throat> the needle penetrations the second time around, go halfway in between. Um, the first penetrations, that's sort of a difference in style. This is what I like the best because I think it makes the most uniform line. Okay, so that's there. I've, I've finished my M with two run stitches, and now I like to bury a stitch between, as we've covered uh, before. It's, it sinks into the fabric, hides more. And then I will come out to actually pass this edge. I'll go around. I'm going to do this fast. About that same four points. And that's one. I'm going to go around real quick a second time. The points should be lined up. When you're done, you're going to be off a little bit. Um, by the time it gets clamped on the final sew out to embroidery's resolution, you're probably going to be okay. So don't stress out that your points are just slightly off. Um, okay, so there's two, but also you see that I had to go back for a third to get to my next letter. All right, and so on and so on. So uh, what I end up with, I'll show you a completed version of this. <clears throat> And I'll show you in 3D. So you can see that I've compensated for the M, for the top of the L, and also the ends of the E. And then um, around the uh, circular parts, there's two ways to do that. The way I'm a fan of is uh, straight lines, just kind of that's the way I always had done it. If you put straight lines close enough together, they'll appear to be a curve. Um, but uh, this one I've done in curves to show you that it can be done either direction. Try and line up your same curved nodes as your, uh, for the second run as you did for the first. All right. Good on the questions. Or, yeah, okay. yeah, we're doing good. Excellent. So that's um, around letters. And then uh, I can show you a finished uh, product of it. Um, this is uh, Melco. Now you have to imagine that this thing is, you know, just uh, about 0.35 inches tall. So it's very small. But you can see here, um, here's a picture of the sew out that I did. Um, I try and cover the same lines uh, with the black as I did to the connecting connectors um, as I did for the original letter color. So you can cover over them. Um, the second layer, and then they're not as noticeable. You know, a question outside of what we're ta talking about today, Scott, is mm -hmm. what do you think is acceptable um, as a length to jump between letters? Oh, yeah. Um, I can pull off uh, longer distances if I'm digi digitizing it myself because, I, as I showed you, I can bury a stitch between the letters. I use that just digitizing regular lettering um, closest point connection um, because it sinks deeper in the fabric. The alphabets um, will not uh, sink a stitch between them. So... Um, uh, eighth of an inch, maybe. It kind of depends on the fabric. If you've got dark thread over a light garment, you can't travel the distances you can if it's closer, if the thread color is closer to the garment color. The rule uh, I usually stick with is one millimeter. Anything less ten. than one millimeter, a jump stitch is acceptable. Anything more than one millimeter, um, I like to put a trim in. It's worth trimming, yeah. Um, and we've talked before, I mean, whenever you get the choice, keep the machine sewing and try and trim between words because on quarter-inch letters, if you're asking it to do three tie-ins, two tie-offs per letter, it's going to uh, distort the letters as well as the machine never gets a rhythm. The machine wants to keep sewing and keep 
keep going once it's got a rhythm going and so you're going to get better results. But I understand today's customers are just very finicky about any of the stitches between the letters. So um, <clears throat> I think 10 points is probably good. Um, darker colors, maybe 15 points. Um, but again, you've got to use closest point connection. This is also really important that I outline these letters with black right after I create them. Because if I wait and come back to black at the end of the whole logo, um, this is not going to be where I put it. So add an extra color change and just hammer the outline, get it done um, right after you do the letters. Okay. Um, also, your outlines. I've stressed this before. I'm going to show you again. They got to be in dark. They have to be in dark colors. Um, you get this uh, phenomenon, embroidery, that's always existed. Where if you put light colored walk stitches over a dark garment, um, you're going to see the holes and not the thread. So um, let me show you this one here. Um, here kind of is like a an illusion or something. Huh? Yeah. Well, I think it's because on. You see the shadow of the thread as it goes down the hole if you're talking about um, light colored threads. Look at the same exact logo. All I did was change the color from black to silver um, because I uh, sewed it on a different garment. And this, this looks terrible. It's like the neon sign dashed look. Um, the only way around it is to simplify this and maybe enlarge it and fatten it up. This whole logo is two and a half inches wide, so it's kind of hard to get your reference. But um, you, you want to make sure with your customer that they're not going to end up doing this. Some people have tried charcoal thread um, border, you know, lines because it's on a black garment. I'm telling you, nothing. So is, you're you're talking about the scroll work between the shields and that uh, that crest in the middle. Yes, um, all the way, like all of these borders. Look at around the top of the yep. crown. So this is how it looks here. You can't even really see, see it. it. It would be best to leave it off in that situation. But here you can see how stuff or looks. Or even the text in that uh, that banner across the bottom. <laughs> yeah, that that you got to imagine. Those are a couple hundredths of an inch. This says the word France. I mean, I can't wow. believe it's even readable but yeah good luck here so age-old problem um, sometimes you just have to tell the customer I have to simplify it we're gonna have to go a little bit larger because I have to do thin satin stitches I mean, you could switch to 60 weight thread get some finer detail and really do something looking good but just be aware that this is gonna always plague you if you try and sew any other color than black basically is where I am on it okay um, so then uh, the other important, a uh, couple of other important parts, uh, points to the walk stitch outlines, um, other than the borders going right after the letters and using dark color, the thread path really needs to be, as you've seen, closest point connect to keep the machine sewing. You wouldn't want to trim every letter of the walk stitches, uh, the outline around it. It would give you bad results. We compensate the letter ends and most important like we said before pull compensation is your friend and so as you can see here if if I'm not seeing the the uh, base color um, outside of the edge of the border um, if it's a walk stitch I know I'm in for trouble and you can see that this on the screen produced the picture that I showed you of the um, orange Melco with the black border. And so when you do this, would it be suggested until you get your bearings on the material for the compensation to do a couple test sew outs to understand that compensation? Uh, how much that you need on it. Yeah, you, you, there is nothing like doing test sew outs. Um, it saves you so much time, especially if you have, you know, 20 stars in a logo or something, and you're not sure how you're going to do them to do one and keep sewing it out till you get it right is a huge time saver because you don't want to have to go and edit the uh, the 20 <laughs> when right. you're all done and again the way that I do this um, is uh, I will select show you the object properties um, just the multi-line so <clears throat> I will start with pull comp at zero okay and that is where 
kind of my lines line up, I happened to do plus one before I started this one, but because of its extra thinness. Gotcha. But normally, if you line the borders up with the edge, that's the easiest way to digitize and then grab the red and add pull comp before you sew it. Hmm. Um, it's really hard to add pull comp first and then decide where the edge probably is. It's just adding distortion and time to it. That's a good point. Okay, so then of course this applies, you know, to logos also, but I'm going to show you uh, one right here. <clears throat> All right, so here is several designs that I've done in the past kind of um when we talk about outlining around logos, detail stitching, um, of course it goes last. It's worth breaking up and finish as you go in case you have a huge design making sure that stuff registers. Um, but normally the path that I will take, I'll start with this mountain guy right here. When it comes to the detail it can be a little bit overwhelming sometimes, um, but what helps is I'm mainly going to walk around the border, but then I'm going to go inside and take care of some finer detail, but I'm always focusing on uh, the border, and I'm going to work my way around as I do the inner detail as I go, and then the last thing I do is a full border, a full walk stitch around the whole outline to make things nice and crisp. So really trying to keep that path in mind so that you don't have a million <clears throat> trims on the detail. Right? Oh yeah, I mean this detail here, the black on here, really there is absolutely no um, trims wow. on the whole thing. So. Um, I can show you, uh, let me see, I'll just, it's hard work in these monitors at lower resolution. Okay, so here is the detail here, and I will slow redraw it, and you can see how the path I was explaining kind of works. So, <clears throat> I'll just take a little bit to draw it. You can see that I move into the detail, but I'm still focused on staying around the border. That's your sort of reference. And this does take some, some time, experience, knowledge. I've stated before, you got to sit down and study a logo, sometimes 10 minutes, and write yourself notes about how you're going to digitize it. It's going to give you better results, less trims in the end. So see how that all worked out and ended yeah, up that's like really that. Cool. Um, but that's the way to do it. Shorten the stitch length to 16 points. Another very uh, important thing is you start at an indiscriminate area. So something that's in a tucked in a corner or something. So your tie-ins and your tie-off stitches will tend to bump out less like that than if Be you started. Than yeah, than if I would have started right on the center of this um, knife sheath. You know, it would probably be noticeable. It'd be better to start in here, and here, something like that. All right, then, of course, as we say, all the rules are meant to be broken. <laughs> um, here is a sunflower. This one is in your custom shapes uh, folder, I think common designs, uh, right here. So you can just drag it up to the screen um, and study it if you like. Um, I'm going to show you this, this border was kind of a little bit uh, different. Um, we're going to go show, hide non-selected, so that I have just this. I know, I did this all in one element. You don't have to do that. Just make sure where you finish one element, then you start the next one at the same point. It can make it less stressful and all that kind of stuff sometimes, too, to break things out. But instead of starting on the outside, like I showed you for the last one, for this one, there's just so much going on in the middle. I decided to attack the middle first and then work my way out. So here's a slow redraw of this. You see we do um, everything in the center. This is just pretty much random. Go around it. Now I'm working my way from the inner petals to the outer petals of the sunflower. And I'm going to finish with that outer border last. So is there a reason that you started in the center on this one? Well, uh, because there was so much going on in the middle, rather than start at the outline outside and then kind of work my way in, I might as well just start um, because this is a 
really unique. Um, and of course, uh, will registration be better if you're doing it, center out? Registration would be better, although there's so much of this already planted on the fabric with the um, the green and the so uh, it's probably center. not going to move much. Not a ton on this one. Gotcha. <clears throat> um, so there we go, like center out, but then we finish with a double um, border. Now you can do, like I said earlier, uh, straights, or you can do curved notes. I, I'm old fashioned, but I just in general like straights, unless I'm doing a large curved shape of a jacket back or something with a walk stitch. I'm going to use curved notes on that. But what I like about using the straight nodes is that. Um, you kind of are deciding where the needle drops. I mean, you set a short stitch length, 18, 16 points, something like that, but pretty much I'm in control of where the, the, the needle is dropping, and, and I like that because you can make sure that uh, your registration positively works. Okay, so um, let me turn everything on. And no questions yet. If you're out there watching us on Facebook, Please post your questions in the comment section so that uh, I can ask them to the master Scott Stingle <laughs> and we can get you the answers. So, so here is um, a different logo, and here is a finish as you go. So for this one, um, it's sort of the nature of it is the swords are behind the skull and the, and the, um, the hat. So I'm going to attack those first because I want to tuck them underneath so they don't look like they're on top. But if I wait till the end for um, the black to go down, there's no way it's going to line up. So um, you can see right here, um, <clears throat> let me just show you the... Um, one color. All right, so I've already done the gray or the, the tan color as you can see and now um, that it comes to the first border you can see how the outline works. It's going to attack each sword and make sure they're finished. So then if they drift later because I'm doing the skull and the detail and all such of stuff on there, it doesn't matter because it's already finished. The outlines are my favorite part. <laughs> it's just this is a neat design. I mean, you just love watching them so because the whole thing comes to life more. Um, uh, but you see how I attack the outside, then I have to come back for um, the hat in the end, and then um, I go back a, another time to black right here, and this is for sort of the second um, or the middle third, I guess you could say of it. And um, let me go on the slow redraw for that. So we'll start with the skull, do the detail, and then walk the border. And uh, we do not walk the plank, uh, but walk the border. Walk the border. Yeah, that's like last week. <laughs> <laughs> and then there is one more I want to just show you, which is the final border. This just takes care of the details around the uh, beads that um, hang from them and stuff like that. All right. Um, and so you broke that border up just, just for registration sake? Or? I did, and for uh, sanity, right? For sanity. So, yeah, <laughs> because it's much easier in this case. I think of this as three different designs. The swords is, uh, is one design, you know, the hat's another, and the skull is a third, or hat and the beads. So, therefore, you know, it's always easy to attack smaller chunks, then sometimes it can be overwhelming looking at a whole logo going, where do I start? I, uh, right? Yeah. So just break it down. Oh, I, can you do a sword? Yeah, I can do a sword. All right. So that's, you know, a third of it. And keep on going. Builds your confidence and gives you better results. But registration was key why I did this one. All right. Um, <clears throat> make sure that I'm not missing anything. And no problem, we don't have any questions yet, so okay. once again, post questions if you have them. So then uh, we're going to move on to column borders, and so several different um, examples of this. Uh, basically, you want to do the border um, before the letters. And how, is fun. how come? 
Yeah, I know, that little guy. So you're doing the borders first? Yeah, so if I look at this, white goes down first. I'll just deal with Melco, and then the red. And how come? Well, several reasons. Um, they can see this. So this is easier to see in 3D. If I do the border first, I can take this column, and I can tuck it way underneath to here. So I'm giving the machine a wider satin, which it loves, instead of trying to line it up with the border and I have less distance. So the other thing about outlined letters with columns is simplify them. All right, it's simpler is crisper. And so when it comes to stuff on like the inside, this E is classic right here. If I tried to put a satin stitch border on the inside, it's going to be filled solid anyway. And sewing all different directions, I have a bad uh, chance or good chance that I would uh, uh, tear a hole in the garment. So just fill them solid. If it's an A and you have the, the triangle, rather than trying to go around it, now this depends on the size, um, and have all those weird angles and all that, just do a triangle of a satin stitch that's just straight across and... Could you turn the red uh, lettering off for a minute so we can sure. see just the column below? Sure. And we could do a slow redraw, and I can kind of explain it. So first we start out with the underlay. Yep. And then I'm going to do the fill in the center. I'm not going to fill the whole entire logo, but I'm going to fill the holes that are going to show up, E, C, and O. Now I'm going to do a fat satin stitch right around the whole border. That's nice and so thick. So the reason that you did the uh, underlay throughout the hole, even where the red's going to be, is so that the white is basically giving you kind of that foundation to lay the red over and you're not going to have compensation issues or right. gaps, right? You, you want to hammer the, the, the um, top fabric to the backing um, <clears throat> and so things don't move around as much. So yeah, right. always take the first color and do underlay or something like that to plaster it flat. Um, so you can see how I did it, and we talked about the thicker borders and all that, um, and then so Melco on top is kind of a no-brainer. Now, when it comes to this little guy here, um, if you have a double border, which I'm going to talk about in a, in a little bit, um, you want to do the outer border most times first. Of course, exceptions to every rule. If you have a banner in the center of this logo that's double bordered, it might switch things up, but let's just take simple. So for this here, I would not wait to the end to do the white. Look at what a mess this would be to try and do this and go or outline everything. So what I do is um, stitch um, the, the white comes in like this. Um, I'll slow redraw it and just show you, let you have a look. So we do the green to plant everything down, adhere the backing to the top material, and after um, we do the green, then we switch to the white, which is the outer border. Do the outer border first, it just a lot of times makes things go so much easier. And after the white border is done and his eyes, then it's going to um, attack the black inner border. Um, here again, I can make the white border fatter, which is going to sew better, um, to put that down first instead of waiting till the end. That's kind of cool how you did the shadowing on the side of the, what do we call him, like a Martian? or uh, He's some software company. Oh, something. is it? Yeah, oh, okay. I, yeah, I did this, oh gosh, 15. He's <clears> horrible. <throat> More years ago. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. Isn't 15 it? years ago. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> yeah, the, that was the end of my sort of professional digitizing logo career, right? <laughs> um, okay, so uh, then, uh, so that's column borders around letters. We've talked about this with Puff in the past and stuff like that. So know that you can get a thicker border if you do it first, plants everything down. Balance the letter, um, place it on top, and you should have good results. All right. Then uh, another type of border is sort of where we let the border define the letters. <clears throat> so I have a design here, part of a design that I did in the past. And uh, let me show you in 3D, get a better look. This is shaded. Um, 
<clears throat> but rather than do a separate fill for each letter, oh, what a mess that would be, and it would double the penetrations around the borders uh, where one letter meets another. It's not a good idea. <clears throat> a better uh, way to do this is to stitch the whole area in the fill color and then actually the the white and the black here will define or make the letter shapes so let's redraw it so first we're going to do our underlay like we always do then i'm doing a, <clears throat> a light color i always like to do the, the dark color for gradients um, second instead of first then it's going to work its way going from heavy at the bottom to light at the top but notice how easy this is. The fabric is spread out. It's planted down. Mm. I mean, I don't like to do a ton of layers, but in this case, it's much better. And the black here is not like a fill over a fill. It's actually auto split or fill if greater than so that it's more of a satin stitch to help stay up on top of the fabric and not just beat it to death. That yellow that you laid down first, the yellow fill, was it? Uh, what kind of density did you use on that yellow fill? Uh, I usually use 35 points. Okay. I use a 30 point stitch length and I use um, yeah, 35 density. And then it depends do you have on the fabric. Stitch directions all going the same direction, or do you have a <coughs> tendency to, to see those penetrations? Generally, kind of normal, or? The, generally, they'll be perpendicular. Your underlay will be perpendicular to your top stitching. However, there is, of course, you know, arguments or people are on different sides, that if your grain of the knit is usually always running up and down, yeah. then it would be better to do like a crosshatch, like a lattice underlay where everything is sort of 45 degrees. Either one works terrific. The thicker the fabric, I switch to um, the 45 degree sort of lattice type gotcha. pattern. So here you can see that actually the borders define the letters, and it simplifies the digitizing um, just a good way to do stuff. I've done a lot like this, as well as easier to digitize. All right, so the borders actually um, define the letters. <clears throat> simple is better. Many times, simple simplifying the border is going to give you a cleaner result, and that's really what the customer wants. Okay, and then we go around logos. So many times <clears throat> I'm stitching a logo uh, on light colored garments, it's all great. Now the customer has switched to a dark colored garment and the embroidery color wise is going to kind of die on there. So uh, very easy in printing to take and just throw a white border around this whole design. Not so easy in, in <laughs> embroidery digitizing, but man does it make a difference. So I have one that's, uh, this one is so cool. The people at the shows are loving this one. This is uh, uh, the Melco duck, we call it. Oh, yeah, this is uh, a great one. And so we're putting this on hats at the shows, as well as a full, huge, what, 13-inch wide jacket pack. That's pretty cool. Um, that we applique uh, both the orange and the, the green. The Melco mallards, huh? <laughs> yes, exactly. All right, so let's talk about the path on this first. You can see what I did was I added a white border around the whole thing because they're, it's going on black hats. So first of all, though, I'm going to start with the Melco because, remember, bottom up, center out. So I'm going to knock the Melco out since it's the lowest, closest to the bill. Get that out of the way. And then I'm going to do the border. Um, kind of depends on the logo. Some logos... I would hold off on this white border until I stitched a lot of the fill that's going to go down inside the design. Here again, plant everything. You're going to get less movement if you've got uh, some embroidery stitched first. The way that the black border around this duck kind of worked, I just decided to do the white first. And, you know, there's not a ton, ton of stitches. The whole thing is. So, 10 Scott, can you tops. turn off all the stitches and just turn on the blocks sure. as you walk through it, please? Sure. So, uh, well, Melco is yep. a no-brainer. And then the border. Here we go with the border. Okay. And, you know, you have your choice around a lot of simpler logos. You can just sim you can use a single line. Um, this one is rounded ends and all sorts of, you know, sort of shapes that don't work well with the single line. So I decided to do it in a column one. Okay. All right. So um, 
yeah, we do the border with a walk stitch, and then you can see we have the different columns to make all of it up, and then we'll attack um, the rest of it. You want me to keep showing you yeah, color by color? Yeah. Okay. Then I do the red, which is going to be his gums, and then we do that white fill, uh, or the, sorry, the orange fill. What's cool about this one is I used a wave. Oh, cool. So that it really reflects, uh, refracts, reflects the light nicely. <laughs> um, okay, so then after we take care of uh, <clears throat> the bill, then we'll attack the head. That's going to be also a curve fill. And then some details, um, stitching inside the edge. <clears throat> Then I'm going to go for some detail stitching um, here around his beak. Then I never white. knew a duck had teeth. It's amazing. <laughs> 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 and then we're going to, I'll take care of his eye and then some dark and then the inner black border. All right. Wow, so that's a neat looking design. It is. But notice one more thing here. You know, like, I don't know if it's just the, the 3D or is one side of the border farther out than the other? And the oh. answer is yes, it is. We talk about you got to do whatever is necessary to make the logo register. And when this was the same distance all the way around, the first sample hat that I did, this white was just um, sinking. It, it was shrinking past or almost getting covered up by the black detail. So after watching it so, Scott, any ideas of why that white was getting sunk on that side? Yeah, I, um, I thought about that too. We're always doing, you know, the middle of the logo in, in the right order and bottom up and all that kind of stuff. But it depends. The, the teeth are going to pull the fabric in a little. Um, and then this, this, this eyes and all that are going to suck it in some more. But really, I'm just going to deal with fixing it because okay. that's the most important thing generally though it has to do with the, how the thread goes down and in what order but um, so kind of how the, the hat is waving or compensating as the the stitches are laid down onto it huh? yeah and if i'm putting down so much in this area here it's going to draw down you know around it so if i had a whole bunch right here this is going to shrink a whole lot more in other words so it depends on kind of where you're stitching around it but bottom line is do whatever it takes to make the thing register because i don't care how it looks on the screen i care how it looks on the fabric so we got a question on this design um from noida uh the six the green six overlapping the white border yeah so that's a that's a lighter detail yeah Okay. Oh, is it? Is that the? Green? Is it? Yeah. Is it overlapping the white? So could you turn off everything except the white and the green? Maybe that might help us see what she's looking for. Um, so it looks like it's in some places. Yeah, it is overlapping, right? And then other places, it's not. Well, you have to remember that we're covering. The black yeah, over the this top. much is going to go over the Got top. It. So, yeah. We tuck it under for one, but then also when it comes to the black, um, take this out of 3D, you can see that there are walk stitches in the black before it does the satin or the column. The reason for that is I need to keep them as separate layers. What happens is you run satin stitches parallel in different colors or whatever. They want to blend in. They want to bleed together. Or they want to pull a, each other apart, right? Right. And so if I put a separating stitch, but you know, in the second color, it, it keeps them from blending in, holds their edge better for registration. Yeah. I know for one, I've digitized before some designs. I'm not as good as you, Scott, yes. but I try. Um, and I had that satin stitch kind of separation issue going on. So by laying a like either a, a, a edge walk down or some kind of kind of foundation stitch, lock stitch type down first, it'll keep them from separating is what you're it saying? It does, 100%. Wow. Yeah, you, you must use underlay. Um, there's some cases where if you have no backing, or like we talked about uh, in other ones, performance wear, where you want to keep as many stitches off of it as possible because it puckers so easily. I know, I know, you know, and I apologize to interrupt, but Please do. I know when I started digitizing, I wanted everything to be in the top stitch. So if it wasn't full enough, if the embroidery didn't look full enough, I would just go in and pound that density, oh. you know, as hard as I could until I started realizing, 
it's kind of like painting a wall, right? If you get a good primer on the wall first, oh, that's an excellent way. You, you, you can use very light paint on the top, and the paint job costs you less, um, and it looks better for the most part. I think it, embroidery digitizing is is spot on with that concept. Do you agree? Definitely, definitely. And we're going to change it, add a little, remove a little, um, based on different fabrics. But the foundation is just so so important. I, you know, when you sew something and it has good, good underlay, as you're watching it sew, it just makes you feel good and confident. Like, ah, I'm relaxed. I know if I see this base that it's gonna be, it's gonna be all good. Um, and that, as we've said, can be the problem with stock designs is the digitizer doesn't know what fabric you're going to put it on. Okay, so underlapping, um, the border goes first. Um, I want to just give you a little help. Some of what I've showed you um, is complex and you're going, wow, how am I going to take on that uh, pirate design or something like that? Yeah. Um, they can be difficult, but let me show you a little help. Well, I think, and while you're pulling that up, Scott, one that you just told me that I'd never thought of is, is kind of taking notes on the design to begin with and not being afraid to take a design and separate it in your mind as you're digitizing it into multiple designs. Yep. So, you know, you can tackle it, like you said, can you do a sword? Absolutely, I can do a sword. Can you do a skull? Yes, I can do a skull. You know, so doing it that way, that's a great, great yeah. concept. I like that. Very simple. Um, okay, so here's another really good help. Um, here's another one we're running at the shows lately that's just excellent. This thing is really big. It's a tiger that's, uh, what, 18 inches wide? Yeah, but before you move on to that one, we have another question okay. back on the duck. Oh, okay. Um, could you, um, could have you taken and done a... A underlay of the whole duck um, to get it to hold in place um, or are there other uh, things other than the material moving um, when sewing caps that would would make it not relevant to put that underlay down um, my thought on it as Scott's pondering this is I typically on on a flat where we've got a, uh, a hoop all the way around the material um, I think that that's a good concept to have that underlay down first. Mm -hmm. But on a hat, not only are we dealing with the pull compensation of the material, we're also having the waving of how the thread moves that cap around because we're, in most cases, if you're using the wide angle cap frame, we're only holding it down by the bill and we're not that's holding right. it on the sides of the top. So um, my assumption of why you didn't do it that way is Sick. because of how the hat moves not just the material that we're trying to primer against yeah if it was on a knit shirt i would tend to go for i think a full just plant down a good um, maybe a lattice fill um, first to separate it um, cool okay i think that answers that part. so here's a, another help this thing is wow, seventy-five thousand stitches it has double applique we do uh, tackle twill for all the black and then come back and then do uh, applique for the orange impressive cool looking design um, <clears throat> but when it comes to this black man where where does where does it break up I mean how does this interact with that it's all yeah it scares me right so some help you can do is use either your vector lines like I had talked about earlier or walk stitch lines if you don't have the um, vector uh, tool. So if, um, <clears throat> let's see, first I'm going to turn off everything in the design so that you can see the vectors. And now look um, and see that I have drawn red vector lines just because they show up and it's allowing me as I path it out in my head you know taking the notes putting vector lines um, pre-digitizing anything that helps um, works and now you can see oh this makes it much easier right because this looked like well where does one end and one start Ooh. I just segmented them out so I know okay look I can do this that's easy right I can do the eye here I know that this comes down different so I'm I'm taking off smaller bites and makes it easier to do the whole thing um, 
and around here. I know, oh, I'm going to fill this, but I'm going to put a column border around the whole outside, around the teeth and everything. This just sort of helps break it up. Is that so I'm, I'm hearing kind sense? of a, a, from everything that you've started with, and I know that we're talking about borders, but just in digitizing in general, the prep work that you do before you start digitizing a design, analyzing the design, breaking it up into pieces, sounds like it's a really important step um, before you start digitizing so that you don't uh, quote unquote paint yourself or stitch yourself into a corner, right? That's exactly true. Um, <clears throat> that's sort of the issue today is the prices are so cheap everybody has to get them out so fast. They just jump in, start going, you know, instead of man, the studying and thinking of going back to colors and making yourself notes and know that the second white is his nose, his eye, and whatever. Um, really, really makes a difference. And to draw some lines, sometimes I'll use vector uh, lines also to show me the direction or the angle that I, of the stitch of the fill. Gotcha. So you know that kind of the light can bounce if you change the directions and all that. So cool. I can't overstate sitting down. I still have to do it and plan it out. Um, it just makes well, things go so, so much better. I mean, your designs are always awesome, so <laughs> there, there must be something to that. So. Well, as part of this is I started when everything was done on a board. And wow. so you had to draw everything, draw the stitches in, color it. And so sometimes I miss that still because I don't easily have this capability unless I draw the vector lines like I used to with dividers and just, uh, I don't know, old fashioned, right? Okay, so hopefully that's going to help you um, with vector or walk stitch lines to um, give yourself some help. Um, <clears throat> double borders is last. I know I've gone a long time. I never can stop. <laughs> You're fine. Keep going. It's good stuff. <laughs> um, okay, so double borders we talked about doing the inner border first so let's just say here's my uh, fill and I'm gonna put to keep it simple I'm gonna put a double border around it well I could grab the single line tool and go around it and all but remember we have change element type which you can add or replace so in this case I highlight the fill and then I'm going to use shift because that adds a single line to it all right, and then we'll wow, that's a cool stitch feature. this. And uh, yeah, that's Mike. You came up with that. Was, this is the best feature. Yeah, you've come up with. I think I love it. Uh, the other way you can do it is change element type. If you can't remember the shortcut, and you pick what you want and add or replace, but it's a shortcut way to do it. Okay, so when I uh, added the single line border to it, it used single line center because that's default. Um, <coughs> Uh, this is going to be the outer border, um, and so uh, depending on where it fits, I can change the percentage, but let me show you how to add a second one. So I've got this. I'm just going to go Control D for duplicate. Change this to, uh, let's just say, white. Well, now they're over the top of one another, but if I bring up the properties and I go to single line, I can change um, where the border lands, and so I'll try right. That's on the inside. That's good. Um, change the width. Change whatever you want like that. And then I can go into this, get the properties on it, and uh, change the percentage left, right. Sometimes custom is better. So I would go left, but I might do 80-20. Mm -hmm. So that is going to make sure I get my overlap, right? Um, how things line up. This would, of course, need to be fatter and stuff. But I just wanted to show you that you can make your borders um, off the edge of the fill or whatever the shape is instead of having to digitize each one um, at a time. But once again, if they have an overlap to them, underlay is crucial so that they don't blend into each other. Completely. We never, ever want things to butt up together. They okay. will never look like that on the sew out. Cool. And uh, just one more for the end of the session here, which was kind of cool. Um, when it comes to roadways where you have that line down the center, yeah. or I have a logo here that I did for a brewery that um, has dashed line in it. Um, boy, that's 
that's hard always to figure out, right? So oh, look at that. you would never trim every single dot. That would drive you up a wall. How <laughs> <laughs> far each off. one of those um, blocks? Um, so it looks like 16 points, okay. just to, uh, under a tenth of an inch or so. Okay. Um, that would be a mess to do. And same deal, like I say, if you do a black road for some... I don't know, car club or something where it's showing the road and you have the, the center line. That can always be a challenge to do. So, how did I do this one? Well, first of all, we started, of course, with the under like lay like we talked, and then we sti I stitched the fat border under the whole thing. Then we stitched to, we switched to the uh, yellow to do the dashes. Um, and then when I finish up, I go with just an inner border, right? So that's going to cover all the walk stitches. Um, let me show you, and I can turn off a color. You see, so we put down the brown first, and then I did the yellow, but I used where I'm going to cover later with, with a column stitch um, for my walk stitches. Then there's I don't have to trim everything, and then when I go put the column border on after, <laughs> it covers it all up and looks great, huh? Yeah. Interesting. Uh, you can use decorative stitch borders with our decorative stitch um, stuff, and, and I'm not going to get into all that. But uh, this is kind of a unique one that I wanted to show you um, just for fun. Cool. We have a question from Please. Judy. Okay. Judy is asking if there is a list or a document, I would assume is what she's asking, um, for all the shortcuts um, in Design Shop. Uh, by that, I think you mean accelerator. Like the keys? Uh, well, the like the shift click to um, add a border around or uh, the change element type. Um, so mm. you were able to take the fill and press shift and click on the uh, on the column tool to add the border around it. Do we have a list of those somewhere? Not that I know of. I think you know for you'd have to look like change element type, and it would explain the different ones. Any ones you you can think of that we have? Yeah, I I just uh, previewed our um, the design shop document because typically Nate's really good at at getting those things in for us. It is change element type. So if you knew something that you were looking for, but Judy, that's a a good uh, good thing. We'll write that down as a future kind of document that we'd like to share with everybody is um, a kind of a cheat sheet to the shortcuts. Um, one thing, like Scott said, you could always go up to the accelerator editor. So I believe that's under tools. Yep, and accelerator editor. So you can look at these. If you click on the commands over to the left, um, it'll tell you what keys that you can use to actually do those shortcuts. And if you find one that you would like to have that we don't have, you can potentially go in and, and add a uh, or assign one, correct? Yeah, there, it's just, just covers just everything. Um, you can even make a hotkey to fire up the accelerator editor. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, kind of as you pick the, the keys, it's, it's important because once you've set them, you... you really can't change them because you learn the system on that way uh, that way so <laughs> kind of very important to make good decisions at the beginning sort of where your hands lay out my own is I use W for walk stitch and I use Q for column one because they're next to each other they're by my left hand easy to hit um, cool. so All right, yeah. we'll, we'll take that um, I'm gonna write that down uh, and thank you for that Judy that's a that's a great suggestion so hopefully uh, I've covered a lot of different border types um, and you picked up some good information today and um, we will uh, continue to monitor this so if you have any questions we can uh, answer them later and we will put this up recorded of course as soon as it's done so um, we'll look forward to seeing you next time hopefully you got uh, some good information on today's session. Have a good day. Have a good day.